Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Jones. I'm with the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension in Gila County, and I'm here to do the Garden and Country Extension webinar. Um, my title today is Bark Beetles, Management and Control in Arizona. And uh, let me just stop right there and make sure I'm, I got a sound check here. Can you can y'all hear me okay? Just give me a little thumbs up. Right on. Okay, thanks, Barry. Um, I'm gonna get back to my slides here. Sorry about that. A little bit about my um, webinar series. Um, I've, these have been a weekly Zoom webinar, 60 minutes or less, Thursdays at 11 a.m. They feature a variety of horticultural and natural resources topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County, Arizona. And of course, if you are here, it's of interest to you, wherever you, you live. A uh, recording of this will be posted at extension.arizona.edu slash Gila, or you can email me at ckjones at arizona.edu. Um, these webinars get uh, put onto a YouTube playlist at the University of Arizona. It typically takes between one and seven days for me to get that up there, and they're all available on that archive. And the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. And so with that, it is my cue to um, put up my poll here for the affirmative action. If you'll just take a moment to answer these questions, um, just three simple questions here, and they are anonymous. And if you just take a few minutes to do that, I'll shut that down after I finish going through this. All right, thanks for all that feedback on the sound. Um, here we are, the title, Bark Beetles, Management and Control in Arizona. I am not only your moderator today, but I am your presenter. So our title here, we're gonna, I've got about a half hour presentation. We'll see how long that goes. I'll have time for some Q&A, so I'll open the, I'll read your messages. Go ahead and put that into the chat box typically. Um, and then we'll wrap up at, at the end here. I, I see several people and names that I know, so we may just allow you to talk and we can have a nice little discussion. So thank you so much for joining me today. And here I am, I'm Chris Jones. I'm an extension agent in Gila County with the University of Arizona. So you know how you don't always have pictures of yourself and you just cut the other person on the side? Yeah, that's, that's it. So um, I'll end that show. <laughs> and when I, I'm not the moderator, I don't share that screen. So I'm stuck with having to go back and forth. So sorry if that's a little annoying. Um, all right, so before I get started here, because just for that reason, I'm going to share a, a message with you. Oh, come on. There we go. Um, this presentation is about management and the control. I am not doing anything on identification. I have put into the chat box a link to a presentation that I hosted last year with our state forest health specialist, Ali McAlexander. She talked about how, how we, what are all the different bark beetles that exist in Arizona, how to identify them, where they've been identified. Um, it was just kind of, they do annual reports on forest health. And that also includes a, a healthy forest program that if you do get bark beetles, there is kind of a 50-50 share with the state to help take out infected trees, which you may be able to qualify for. So please take some time. If that's going to be your issue, we can talk more about that as we go. Um, but like I said, today we're just going to talk about management and control. I'm not going to show you how to find beetles or what, what they look like. So here's my presentation. I'm going to move my um, 
camera just a little bit to make sure I can see what I'm talking about here. And there's our outline for today. First thing to know, there is no cure. Once your tree has a bark, the, the bark beetles have been able to successfully invade your tree, you know, the tree is going to die. So prevention is the key. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about monitoring, about tree removal, um, why it's important to do some slash and wood management, the actions you can take. Going to talk about how a healthy forest helps a healthy tree. Thinning and spacing works. How to irrigate and then how tree age, how tree injuries can be an issue. Then we'll talk a little bit about insecticides. Um, sprays have been used for a long time. There's some new injections and pheromones getting used. And then I'll finish up by talking about some fertilizer and other fly-by-night fixes that we'll get some people offering. So the first thing to note is there is no cure. Once the bark beetle is able to in come in, invade the tree and start to get a large enough population in there, the tree's not able to overcome that. So basically bark beetles get right underneath the um, bark of the tree, that's why they get that name. They feed on the, the cambium area, that phloem and xylem that's very young and, and, and where, the where the water and food tends to move up and down. And eventually there'll be a large enough uh, population in a tree that it girdles the tree. It successfully goes completely around that um, phloem layer and the tree's no longer able to move food and water up and down and it is essentially dead. So prevention is the key. So how can you keep beetles out of your pines? We're gonna be focusing mostly on the ponderosa pine today, but much of this applies to bark beetles that maybe get into cypress, pinion pine, or the mixed conifer. Um, was able to find some cool images online. When you see the bark beetle like this, they're typically about the size of a grain of rice, if you're unfamiliar with them. Um, they can be a little bit smaller, they can be a little bit bigger by their, their species. And you should monitor often frequently. And of course, I mean often frequently. And if you don't get this reference, well, I'm not gonna explain it because when I've tried in the past, it goes over like a Led Zeppelin. And so you can give me a little thumbs up or a, feedback on that if you actually get this reference. All right, so monitor frequently. When you look at the trees, you should have a, a pair of binoculars because they're often up in the upper bowls of the branches. Um, you're going to be looking for faded needles. They'll start to turn light green. It'll look a little bit washed out. This is because the tree can no longer photosynthesize. And this is the first thing you'll see. And when we're going through some of the uh, att attacks that we see, you'll, you can kind of get your eye attuned to this, where you just see that tree doesn't look like the right color anymore. Eventually, you'll start to see some red or brown needles. The tree's definitely dead by then. Another thing to look for is evidence of pitch tubes. I'm going to show a few images of that in a moment here. Um, Frass that will build up in the bark crevices or at the base of the tree is another really good way to look at them. And the most common species, uh, yeah, the, the most common species of bark beetle that we have in Arizona or, or genus is called Ips. And this particular genus will often attack in the upper bowls and in the branches. So you'll need to look for them with binoculars to see if you can find them. So here's an example of what that fading looks like. If you look over here on this side, you know, they haven't really gone out of color yet, but they cont continually to go into a brown or red color as, as the tree dies. And you should be able to look for pitch tubes. Now, if you see a pitch tube like this, that is white, and particularly if you see a beetle inside that pitch tube, the tree has actually been able to successfully defend itself from that entry of the beetle. Um, unfortunately, with the drought we've been going through in Arizona, particularly over the past 
you know, 15, 20, 25 years, the trees, ponderosas will get so dry that the tree really doesn't have the ability to create that sap and, and punch those beetles out. So um, oftentimes you'll see the beetle, the frass on it the, and this, that it's got orange. It's got the color of the um, bark that it was able to come in on. It's starting to, to kick out the frass that it's eaten. And that's a telltale sign that they have been, they've had a successful entry into the tree. Some other manifestations that you'll look at is you'll see some of this boring dust in the crevices or at the base of the tree where the beetles come into it. So another way you're able to look at the tree, look for those frass piles and, and where they're attacking the tree. This, this image over here, I'm not in the way for you guys, um, will actually show that the beetles are in a tree that's already been cut down or they're the slash piles from them and they're, all, they're in there and they can still take advantage of that um, material because there's just enough moisture in there, the, the conditions are still right. You know, you'll see those frass piles. And in the dry years that we have now, oftentimes you may even just see the boring dust or the frass be present. And so that is a year where the tree really has no defense. It's just completely dried out. Okay, I've got the beetles, what now, right? Okay, so the most important, but if you can, you know, you, you need to cut down the infested trees. And one tree full of beetles is simply going to be the home for many more beetles to come out and affect the rest of your, your forest and trees. So it's important to cut down the trees. Now, realize operating a chainsaw is inherently dangerous. And I strongly recommend that you hire an experienced forester or arborist to cut down your trees. So it's an expensive adventure like I, just, like I was alluding to. Arizona has a healthy forest program, a bark beetle management program that can help homeowners to uh, get a kind of a 50-50 match from the state. I'll talk some more about that when we go to our Q&A. You'll need to manage your bark beetle habitat. And so where are those beetles living? And which that means that you'll need to do something about the slash and about the logs that you cut down because they're in there. As that image I showed earlier, they'll use that information, that space and come out to hit other trees. So um, I think I just explained explain that. You can attract and breed more beetles and you should be aware of current and forecasted beetle activity in your area uh, that other presentation that I shared in the chat box goes into well last year's um, forecast, and I can go in and I can get you uh, access to our Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management that has the updated the 2021 report. All right, so you've got the beetles, and you'll need to manage that bark beetle habitat. That treatment should occur within about 30 days that they attack. Uh, and that slash production should be avoided from as early as January and into July for that Ips beetle, which kills majority of our pines in, the, in Arizona, that, that at least where people live. We've got higher elevations on the forest. We've got several other bark beetles that, that are active. Um, Look at these piles, you know, these ones here are set up for, for, for burning at some point, but they are out here where, you know, that is material for the particular zips beetles to take advantage of, and they can head out and attack some of the other trees. So it's important to remove those slash and logs. Now, one, op one opportunity is that if you remove the bark, you remove that habitat for the beetle. Um, Certainly not an easy thing to do, but there are certain tools for debarking trees and, and a way that you're able to keep that wood on your site. You can remove the logs and slash. You can take them to a burn pit or landfill. We are starting to speak a lot more about using, about the importance of biochar. And, they, and there are some simple kilns that can be made that can take this wood and help to burn it down into biochar. Another practice that is discussed is solar sterilization. And if you use this technique, you need to make sure that 
They're covered well with the plastic. Look at this event, this, this example where you know they've got the plastic underneath, it's well covered, only two stacks high. You'll want to turn those logs in the summer in the summer. Um, the problem with people have difficulty using sterilization because if the beetles come out, they can chew right through that plastic, comes right off their other end, and off they go. So um, using that heat, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to bake them in there. You, they're not, you're not really going to keep those beetles in a plastic bag, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but, but, if you've got, but that's another technique that's well, well documented and used. Another thing that helps to reduce bark beetle habitat is to split the wood. So if you already split it, you break up the, that phloem layer and it no longer is useful for that beetle. So if you're able to go in and buck and split it for firewood right away, that makes good use of it. Dry it in the sun and don't stack it in the shade or next to a live tree. Again, that bark beetle, that, that, that fresh cut wood is an attractant for the Ips bark beetle. And if it's right next to your live tree, well, that's the first source of a, of a habitat for those beetles emerging. And another popular thing to do, another thing that's recommended is to chip and scatter the wood. But be aware, I'm sorry about this, I've got my camera in the way. <laughs> they, the chipping and scattering can attract beetles. And so it's best to do this in Arizona in the fall months. So after those bark beetles have had their, um, uh, you know, we go into the fall, they're not active. And, and so that way you're able to scatter it out and it has a chance to dry and become less conducive for bark beetles to use throughout the winter. But I was mentioning that January, particularly lower elevations where it warms up, we didn't get snow, another dry year. And well into July, when the monsoons finally come, it kind of changes that um, situation. I want to tell you just a little bit about biochar. Um, you, again, you can take your logs to a burn pit or a landfill, but burning the wood, you're able to turn, ca create a, a charcoal. And when that charcoal is returned to the ground, it is a very stable form of carbon and will actually stay in the ground for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's considered to be a, a negative carbon um, technology, very simple. And this certain type of kiln allows the wood to burn at the bottom where it's oxygen starved. They put the smaller wood at the top here. Um, because you've got that wood there, it tends to burn the smoke. So it doesn't create as much smoke as you think it might. And then the wood at the bottom just turns to charcoal and you're able to turn that around. Very simple technology. All right, moving on from that technology, another way to prevent bark beetle attacks is by having a healthy forest. That's hard to do when we're in the droughts that we're in these days. But if the tree is healthy, it's got enough moisture, it can pitch that bark beetle out. It's not sending out scents that the, plant, that the um, bark beetle says, this is good food for me or good habitat. So thinning around individual trees can improve that individual tree health. So particularly if it's something where it's your home, um, that, that makes more sense to be able to do. It's your yard, yard tree, take care of it. Be aware that creating slash during the beetle season can attract those beetles. So the best to be doing this type of work during the winter months. And we recommend working with a certified professional forester or a certified professional arborist for this type of work. We also have resources through our extension offices, which is kind of just me in Arizona, um, and of course the state forestry um, that we can work with. So the idea of thinning, and I wasn't able to really find a recommended density, but it's going from where it's particularly thick to where it's a bit more open, and it just allows that tree to have less competition, less stress, get more water from the ground and, and survive um, and, and hopefully survive, right? Uh, 
So this is something where you would have 60 square feet per acre. This is 120 twice as thick. Uh, and really, I look at doing this where what is considered fire, fire wise ignition, fire wise principles also will be good for keeping your trees healthy, the ones that you, you keep. And just to quickly go into that fire wise, um, what we call the home ignition zone, uh, and how to space those trees. Right up next to the house, we don't recommend having anything that can be flammable. I'm gonna talk, actually talk the presentation on this next week. In that intermediate zone, which is kind of your yard space, trees should be in clumps or individuals, be at least 18 feet apart, five to 30 feet from the house, and minimum 18 feet between the tree tops. So just kind of widening it out, you can have them together in clumps, but then creating that distance in there. This other zone, we call the um, extended zone. We've got clumps of trees again. They should be at least 12 feet apart. And when you get out and further from the house, at least 60 feet to 100 feet, then they should be at least six feet apart. That, that may or may not work. And in all cases, talk with your local um, foresters, fire department, find out what works best for this. And just a little bit more about pruning. Uh, Keep trees and shrubs a minimum of feet, 10 feet away from the lower branches. So if you got some small shrubs and tall shrubs, keep try to create that distance there. If they're mature trees, they should be at least six to 10 feet up off the ground. And if they're smaller, just kind of use this one third. So if the height of that tree is about two thirds up here, one third down there. I think these are good graphics for some general ideas on good ways to prune for for controlling wildfire. And again, this can help to make your trees healthy. All right, should you irrigate? Um, do you have the water, right? And uh, issues with irrigating is it's much warmer and drier over the last 20 years, particularly here in Arizona. And these dry winter conditions are becoming more common. So it just really sets up these trees to be susceptible to bark beetle attack. And if they've got some type, some water that can really help them to be successful. Um, so when you water, and again, this is back to a whole other watering idea here, it should be two to three feet deep in that root zone. I really like these drip line tubes that we're seeing that have about 12 to 18 inches between drip spaces that you're able to set out there. Um, and also using the soaker hoses. The nice thing about these drip line tubes is they are much more um, sturdy than the soaker hoses. The soaker hoses, if you tried them before, they crack and they spurt all over when you got the cracks. These drip line tubes work well. Set them out where that tree canopy is at the end. That's where you're gonna find the roots of the tree. And if it's freezing at night, you know, obviously that's not gonna work. So water it during the day you're gonna probably wanna have it out there six to eight hours, depending on how, um, how, how uh, what, what type of soil conditions you have, whether your soils are sandy or, or more like clay. Uh, so you, they need sufficient irrigation. What could be too much? Because then you're just wasting water. So pick the trees that are in your um, yard, in your, you know, most important to you to do this for. If it's really out in the forest, or it's not really practical, I understand that. And, and do you have a sustainable water source that you can use? Here in Arizona, we're using groundwater most of the in most situations. And so uh, something I'd like for, you know, I think is good to do if, you're, if you've got the water and, and it makes sense. So some, some deference there. Also, you should avoid tree injuries. So a lot of times we're going in, we've got a new subdivision coming in, they're doing construction, they're doing excavation that can disturb the roots, putting in septic systems or, or sewer systems, mechanical damage where they you know, hit up against the tree and, and create some uh, scarring, you know, gashes into the bark or soil compaction. All of these tree injuries can weaken that tree 
or create openings that are that can attract those bark beetles. So watch out and try to avoid those tree injuries. There are many examples of where they've been building a home and trying to save, you know, pick trees that they keep, and then suddenly, you know, they've got a lot of trouble. So look at this line here, you know, they want to make sure they don't go in there and damage those trees. All right, let's move on to using some of the chemical treatments that are available. Uh, there are insecticidal sprays and insecticide injection that's been approved recently, use of pheromones, which can attract the bark beetles or, or repel them. And then I'm gonna talk, finish up here with using some fertilizers and other fly by night fixes that you may have heard, heard about. So using an insecticide spray, um, this is a well-established uh, practice for prevention. It is ineffective on trees that are already infested. So if you are already seeing the pitch tubes, you're already seeing you know, the frass, you're already seeing the fading of the needles, it's not gonna help that tree. You've gotta go to a tree that's healthy, that's still alive. Um, and the treatment needs to be from the root collar all the way up into the major limbs. And even some of those small limbs and branches for the Ips beetle, which again is our most common um, bark beetle in Arizona. We recommend that these treatments should occur before April 1 in Arizona. So it's still cool enough for the, um, before the bark beetles start their flight. Lower elevations, we may even need to do that earlier. The residual effect can last one to three years. And so talk with your uh, pesticide applicator who does that. The research shows it can last two or three years. So if they're, so see what they say, if you're able to have that effective for one year or two years, you know, just looking at those conditions of bark beetle um, activity in your area. So these are three registered insecticidal sprays that are used. These are the active ingredients. These are the registered names or the trade names that you'll buy them by. Carbaryl, permethrin, and bifenthrin. Um, each are toxic to honeybees and aquatic fauna. They tend to have a little lower toxicity to birds and mammals, but particularly our insects and um, are, are really, you know, they're insects, so they're, they're um, susceptible. That if you're going to be spraying the trees, they need to be at a time that has a chance to dry before it gets to the honeybees or a time that they're not really in, act in action. And just a little bit about their costs. Um, this is information here that I got from a researcher. Um, and this is a couple years old. We've been experiencing some infl inflation here, but you can see that these treatments, $3 a tree, $7 a tree, $4 a tree, they're not particularly expensive for the insecticide itself. The, the, you, if you saw that picture earlier, let me bounce back to it here. Um, you know, we, we gotta have enough spray, you know, that, that, that labor is gonna be what you're paying for for that treatment. And a little bit about the ecological risk that's in the, the research. Um, 97% of the spray deposition has, occurs within 50 feet of the tree bowl, bowl when they do the spraying and the research they've done. The application efficiency, the percentage that is applied or retained on the tree is between 81 to 87%. So most of it stays on that tree. And as you can see from this, the further you get away and kind of the prevailing wind, it starts to, to stay close. So most of that is right here, kind of within that what's this, seven meters, so within 25 feet. So a no spray buffer should be at least 25 feet to protect freshwater fish, amphibians, crustaceans, and aquatic insects. And then buffers of greater than 75 feet appear to be su sufficient to protect aquatic insects. All right, a little bit about the injections. Um, Emimectin benzoate, has been found to be effective against Western pine beetle in Ponderosa, as well as Ips. 
is ineffective on trees that are already infested. I'm gonna keep on repeating that, I guess. <laughs> um, some things with this, soil moisture and temperature factors complicate the timing of the tree, the timing of treatment. It is important that when you put in a, uh, this injectable treatment, the tree has active sap, you know, that's gonna be able to move it throughout the tree. So that has to do with the moisture temperatures that it's not getting translocated and then it getting stored in the phloem of the tree. Um, but, you know, what I've talked to, to them when it's spring and the tree is active, there's enough moisture, it doesn't take too long for it to be able to translocate, protect the tree. And a certified pesticide applicator is again recommended. The trade name for this is triage. And uh, it was derived out of uh, fermentation of a soil bacterium. It disrupts the neurotransmitters caused by irreversible paralysis. So that's how we kill the fit, kill them, kill the beetles. It's highly toxic to fish and honeybees and very to toxic to aquatic invertebrates. Um, highly toxic to, mild, to mammals and birds, as well as on acute oral basis, but is dermally benign to mammals. So if you what this, this is trying to say is it's not so dangerous to get on your hand, it's really dangerous to eat it, but it's an injection. So, you know, you're keeping it in a closed system where it's not getting out there like a spray. So that's a great benefit. Um, it's, it's received the most attention among systemics for protecting trees from bark beetle attack in the Western US. So just the research is just showing this good stuff about triage. Um, not all the arborists and pesticide applicators are using it right now. So it is fairly new, but um, just a good resource that's out there to look at. However, it's pretty expensive compared to the sprays, if you can see this. This one here, we're looking at $123 per tree. This one, $122 per tree. Would have to see that you as a homeowner that is having this type of treatment used um, compared, because it's probably not the same labor that goes into spraying a tree, but uh, talk with the arborist, talk with the pesticide applicator that's, that, that you work with for this. And pheromones are also a lot of research been going into pheromones and how those can be used to uh, control bark beetle attacks. So the beetles themselves, will put out an aggregating pheromone or an anti-aggregating pheromone. The idea is trees will, beetles will enter into a tree. There'll be a lot of room to coming in. They'll send, in, send out these aggregating pheromones and more beetles come to that tree. When it is fully occupied, the beetle will start sending out anti-aggregating pheromones. And that will tell the bees, that the, the beetles to go somewhere else. So when they're used and they've got pheromones for both of these, um, they can be, so they'll use that aggregating pheromone for trapping bark beetles. They may use those to show when flights start, know what they're, what they're doing. Um, however, as a homeowner, it may attract too many beetles and then it'll spill over and start going into your other trees. So um, it's better for forestry applications rather than um, landscape, home landscape applications. The anti-aggregating pheromones are used to inhibit bark beetles. So again, they come, they smell this, it confuses them, they, they keep on flying. There's this uh, trade name called verbenone, which is demonstrating promising application. It has limited dispersal range. So, you know, they're, it's not gonna go far from the, the packet that's set out there. And again, the dispersal sensitive, it's, it's sensitive to temperature and humidity. So, you know, if you don't, it's not warm enough, humidity might be able to hold it down, winds. So some, some things with far as that goes. So these, um, this verbenone is available in pouches and bubble caps and plastic flakes. You may have gone out into the forest and see some of these pouches getting set out. There is a formulation of it they call SPLAT. 
specialized pheromone and lure application technology. And there's something about this that is just more flowable and the biodegradable formulation that is making a more effective um, formulation of the pheromone for use. And looking again at Dr. Fetig's work, this has been used as a repellent. They've done some re research on Ips pinei in Ponderosa in Arizona, a common Ips one, shows promising results for helping to prevent slash colonization. So the idea that they can put this on slash piles and the beetles don't take advantage of that is, is promising. And there's encouraging results for attracting something called an insect called Timachila cor corodia, which is a common bark beetle predator. So if we got predators on the bark beetles, that's a good thing too. So a little bit about the Verbenon. Um, I went online and I was able to find a hundred of these pouches for $800. So $8 a tree, not not so expensive, pretty easy to settle them out there. Um, this one that's called the this, this Splat Technology, uh, 10 of these pouches comes in at about 14.35 per tree and 10 of the tubes. So this is basically comes in, a, this is like um, a caulking tube that you can put a little bit on each, each tree. And, and, you know, I recommend that you work with a professional registered, registered herbicide applicator for this. Um, this is kind of an early research in Arizona. I believe they're using this verbenon in some of the other states like Oregon, and they're showing just a lot of promise in its use. Okay, fertilizers and other fly-by-night fixes here. Um, there's people will sell you things that may or may not help your tree to, to live any better. So um, they've done the research, we've got this published. The fertilizer does not protect a beetle against drought or bark beetles. Um, as a matter of fact, a fertilizer may try to stimulate that tree to grow when it has even less water than it needs to be able to, to take, take advantage of it and actually stress that tree out, making it more susceptible to uh, bark beetles. I've seen things where it's a little bit of nitrogen and a lot of phosphorus and potassium. And I just don't know what that's doing to help the bark beetle, but you, you can certainly find people who will apply that for you at a price. Um, systemic pesticides applied via soil application or drenching has not been proven. So if people are to say that they can come in, they're gonna give systemic, the, and they do that drenching, while it may work for different types of insects, it's not good for bark beetles. And a lot of times what happens with this drenching is it's traveling up through the, flow, the xylem and it's getting up into the needles. And if it's a, uh, a foliar type of insect, then drenching can be pretty successful. But as far as it going back down into the, the rest of the tree, it's just anyway, not there. Another research that is looked at is using acoustics. And so they'll send out sounds that might be able to confuse and move those bark beetles out. Um, this type of research is still in its early stages. Somebody says they're gonna do something like, um, you've got those little sounds for, for your gophers. It's not gonna work for your bark beetles. And that's the end. Thank you so much for staying with me throughout the presentation here. I will open this up for questions. Um, let me, sorry, I gotta move this camera again here. Uh, wanna refer you back that I do have an evaluation and I'll put that back in here. Just go ahead and open that up and fill that out for me at the end. And I'm gonna start going through Jen Jen <laughs> Jennifer, thank you that you're laughing at my joke and don't, even though you don't get it. All right. So um, JB, it's great having you here. Uh, I'm, you, you must've woke up early today. 
uh, JV's out in, out in Hawaii, if you guys don't know JV. At, at what point are cut logs no longer attractive to the beetles? Do they still attract dry, dry wood? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, it's gonna have to do with how long that phloem has the right amount of moisture that those ips and other beetles can take advantage of. So they can be attractive, I think, depend so it's gonna matter on the, the thickness of the log, right? If it's a small um, slash type of branch to a, you know, 12, 16 inch diameter log. Um, and they can take advantage of the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree. So it can be really several months in my opinion. I'm going to say that I don't really have research on that. Uh, and, and so by splitting the wood and moving it along just really makes a difference. And, and the main point of this JB is when the beetles are in their flight pattern, when it's summertime, particularly here in Arizona, you know, they're just going to be a, a present. And so that's just long enough that it's a big risk to bring in more beetles. Um, Barry, thank you so much for putting in a uh, reference to a extension publication, AZ1752, making guide to making and using biochar in Southern Arizona. Uh, you can find that on my website when I had Jenny Cartiola present on that. And Rachel, you're asking, how often should you irrigate? I have a 20 inch moisture probe. Does that help you make a recommendation? Yeah, Rachel, uh, I'm gonna say, look at how droughty that winter is. We had a good monsoon season this year across much of the state. Um, we are already into December. We had a little bit of rain maybe a few weeks ago. So if you're not having success with that moisture probe going in where you may irrigate, I'm thinking with what we've got going on, you're gonna to wanna to be doing it maybe once a month, every six weeks until we get some, some snow or, or rain. Hopefully that's helpful. Margaret, do bark beetles only infest ponderosa pine? My Arizona cypress are browning, could it be beetles? And Margaret, yes, it could be beetles. Um, we have got a large complex of bark beetles that live in, in Arizona. The great majority of them prefer ponderosa pine. Well, let, let me back up a second here. I'm referring to bark beetles that attack conifers. So conifer trees, and, there, and I'm, there, there are probably bark beetles that'll attack deciduous trees as well. But the conifers in particular all have, all, are, all, are, all, all, I hate this, <laughs> are all hosts for a different beetle. They are typically native, and so they've been together for a long time. There is a cypress bark beetle. Um, Barry, if you look up that uh, publication for me, we've got one on the, the cypress. And, uh, and it, again, irrigation is probably the best opportunity. If it's already browning, good chance it's already out. Okay, let me jump over here, see if anybody did anything with the Q&A, no. And um, Anne says she's used anti-aggregation pheromone packages successfully. They cost three bucks a piece. They need to be placed every 60 feet. So that's great. I had a uh, presentation with uh, Arborists across Arizona, and I don't know what all of them were thinking, but I had some that weren't too sure about how these pheromones worked. And I think, we just, as homeowners, are not too expensive. The idea is to move them along and make those beetles go someplace else. Uh, Barry, thank you so much. Boy, right on top of it. That bark beetle, uh, cypress bark beetles. A lot, we, our publication book has, we've got a lot of publications that Tom DeGomez did about 10 years ago on bark beetles and good information there. Do you, okay, let's, let's keep, we are at the end of those questions there. Um, Dawn, thank you. Uh, she's got one that 
includes bark beetle cypress. I think this may be a little more up to date. I think that's the same one though. We're good. Well, everybody, thank you so much for um, your questions. I'm available here to answer any more. Hopefully I didn't jump through that too fast. And here we go, Q&A. Will verbenone work against Cyprus, Arizona Cypress? I don't know that there's been any research on that, Bill. Um, at $3 a tree, it's probably not too expensive to see if it does have some effect. Uh, but irrigation, uh, spacing, and are, are ways that we are things that we have looked at that can be successful. And I would say if it's not too expensive, if you want to make a little investment on that, it certainly cannot hurt. Um, all right, good deal. And Don mentions that we seem to have had more calls about bark beetles this year, despite the rain. Um, we had just so much drought before we got the rain. So it was really that 18 months that we really got very little rain that set up so many trees to um, be hit by those bark beetles. So we may have been seeing some more of those um, calls after the monsoon started, before the monsoon started, but it just gave those beetles a great chance to build up populations and move around. So yeah, we did have quite a bit of infestation this last year, according to um, Forest Health. And thank you to people who are giving me some thank yous. We'll go ahead and bring this to a close then. I'll bring up my uh, closing slide. Thank you for joining me for my Q&A. And next week, I'll be back. I'm your speaker. We'll be going over firewise landscape principles in the Sonoran Desert. Um, what I did for putting this together, uh, plant materials are often an issue. People say, what, well, what is firewise in the desert? And so I used the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association's plant list, which is really an excellent list for, for the Sonoran Desert. And just kind of gave some guidance on how to use that for different landscaping principles in the desert. So if you're interested in that, please join me and I hope to have you with us then. Everybody have a great day and I'll see you next week.